The Vietnam War, it's over. Your job just begun. A new HBO original limited series. Welcome to the world of spycraft. Strap in. From executive producers Park Chan-wook and Robert Downey Jr. What are you concealing? Based on the Pulitzer Prize winning novel by Viet Thanh Nguyen. What if I told you that I was a communist spy? How did you become this? The Sympathizer, streaming April 14th on Max. Subscription required. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify. The global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Underrated Movie Podcast. This is a podcast where we discuss films that are underrated, underappreciated, and ones that have slipped under the radar and passed most people by. And once a year, an underrated movie that is so bad that it's good. So for this tradition, you know, we've been, I've been keeping it going for a few years now. I wanted to talk about another uh, movie that I thought was just kind of a... A messy masterpiece, a movie that was good for all the wrong reasons, and I wanted to bring on the one of the people who are, who knows the most about movies and the most about schlocky movies, and that is my good buddy Matt from the Matt and Mark Movie Show. Matt, how's it going? Hello, Derek. Happy April Fool's Day. Thank you for having me. I'm always happy to talk schlock. Basically, for me, 365 days a year is April Fool's Day on my show. I want to speak only of bad. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm glad I called the right guy then. Before we dive into it, like I mentioned, you're a master of schlock, but you, you do have your film credentials. Uh, what do you want to tell the people about the Matt and Mark movie show? Oh, yeah, uh, we're the Matt and Mark movie show. We um, I, I like to tell people now that we have serious, uh, somewhat serious conversations about very unserious movies. Our tastes are very eclectic. Uh, we like cult, horror, genre, action, 80s, 90s. Basically, if it comes with a big old bucket of cheese on our celluloid, that's how we prefer things on my show. Uh, we review uh, new releases, but really, in light of the strikes and how light everything's been this past uh, quarter, really, at the Cineplex, we've kind of just been doing a line of retro reviews, which has been really fun you know we're going back checking out older horror movies from the 90s uh much to my co-host chagrin but uh <laughs> it's, a, it's a really fun show very light and uh yeah we, we we welcome all new people obviously we're it's a it's a little like scientology we want to lure you in we're trying to <laughs> lure you in yeah and much like scientology and this movie it's all about conspiracy theories right that's right i i was gonna say the minute i started rewatching this i was like is this Alex Jones? Is this Alex Jones's favorite movie? Because it might be. <laughs> it feels like it, it very well. Could, it very well could be. Uh, and you know that brings me to yeah. I'll just introduce the movie, which is of course uh, directed by Roland Emmerich, which it, who is a name that fans of disaster movies of the '90s and the early aughts, when those movies dominated the box office, might know. He's somebody who, other than disaster movies, which, of course, this is, is also a fan of the conspiracy theory movies, uh, which, of course, this also checks off. He, he got both. He combined his Independence Day with his anonymous creds. So, you know, you get the best of both worlds with that. This one, though, I think that it maybe had been a little past due. The the You're not going to be able to release something and have it do Independence Day numbers in the year 2022, um, as we saw with Independence Day 2. But Matt, what's what's your history with this movie and I guess Roland Emmerich in general? Uh, did you see this one in theaters? 
I did. I, I try to see just about every schlocky piece of crap in theaters. I will say I love Roland Emmerich. I don't say that ironically. I say that with genuine sincerity. I have been obviously a big fan since the first time I sat down in a theater and I saw Stargate, which was my, my first exposure to him. I saw it in the theater and I thought it was like the coolest movie I saw that summer. And then again, he hit us two years later with Independence Day. And I was like, is this guy the best movie maker al- alive? <laughs> And of course, as his career progressed and I got older, (laughs) I was like, you know, sort of went into film school. I was like, "Mm, I'm sort of seeing some some cracks in the armor here. I love it. He I'm also a big fan of disaster movies. So do keep that in mind, listener. I do tend to grade them on a curve simply because I I do love disaster movies. It's a favorite subgenre of mine. I also love that basically when you're talking about disaster movies, Roland Emmerich has kind of become and is still kind of holds the crown. As like the the man, he's the master of disaster or the disaster piece maker, if you will. I think it's weird that with Moonfall specifically, he's kind of covered his greatest hits like a lot. Mm. You know, like I feel like in some degree, The Day After Tomorrow kind of covers familiar territory from Independence Day. And then 2012 kind of covers both of those. And then Moonfall feels like it covers almost everything in his in his filmography so he is a little like i don't want to say rolling stonesy but like you you know what you're getting if you buy the ticket he's he's gonna play the same five songs that's that's kind of what you're paying for so I i respect that but yeah i saw this in the theater i wasn't expecting greatness i will say i loved 2012 i think 2012 is like the best of his like new school cover movies mm. you can't beat independence day it's a stone cold classic but um yeah moonfall is an oddity i'm happy it exists but boy oh boy do i have a lot of complaints about it yeah and you know, you know for me i was i'm you know i'm like i think a couple years behind you you know when you were in film school you know, learning about what good cinema was, I was like, wow, the day after tomorrow is the best fucking thing I've ever seen. Oh my God, Jake Gyllenhaal running from the wolves in the ice. This is awesome. And then, you know, obviously as time went by and uh, the market changed, this was one that it was one of the most independent films of all time. Emmerich uh, didn't have the financial backing that he did previously with those earlier movies. And we saw the box office slowly but surely decline on those movies i actually did make a point to try and see this one in theaters i think i was one of the few were were you among them as well i absolutely was yeah i was there opening weekend simply by virtue of the fact that i was like hey i think if, if, if even if it's crap i think if you're mm-hmm. gonna be a roland emmerich movie the first the best first exposure to it is on the biggest screen possible with a fantastic sound system because at least you will get to see a lot of big destruction you want to see that 50 feet tall. You, you don't want to see that on a, on like a 40 inch TV at home. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I people always kind of throw out the so bad it's good thing. And it's something that I like to reserve to do once a year for April Fool's Day. It always feels appropriate. And they're never movies that I hate. They're always the, you know, I'll call them like the one star heart letterbox reviews because it's ones that I'm like, you get a one star for quality, but you get a heart because I, I do love it and I appreciate it because clearly everybody involved in this movie really cared about it. They weren't just phoning it in like Madam Web or something, you know, they really gave a shit. They really thought they were maybe, maybe not Patrick Wilson. I don't know. But like clearly Roland Emmerich thought he was making some kind of masterpiece. And I think that to be a real so bad, it's good movie. You got to really believe your own your own bullshit a little bit, you know? I definitely think, yeah, you have to get high off your own supply. (laughs) You have to love what you're doing, and he definitely does. I kind of look at Roland Emmerich at this stage in his career. He's like... He's like Rocky and Rocky Six. He's tasted <laughs> greatness, but it's mm-hmm. been a long time. He lives in a shitty trailer now. And every sort of exhibition match that we, the audience, know is not a title fight. To him, it's the biggest fight in the world. So I'm pretty sure, to stretch this metaphor even further, I think in Roland Emmerich's brain, he thought this was maybe going to be his chance at a comeback. Uh, maybe an Independence Day-like hit for him, right? Rocky returning to mm-hmm. heavyweight roots. And, uh, mm, boy, uh, uh, modern audiences were not ready for, for, for Roland Emmerich's vision of, of, uh, of Alec Jones's wet dream. <laughs> he was not ready. Yeah. Was not ready. Yeah. Th- this movie, it really is something else. It's, 
it's really because yeah i think maybe five ten years earlier it might have been a hit i don't know um because it does you know feel like you said very much like the greatest hits of amrick's career but it also does feel like ironically enough because this movie is all about ai and ai being good or evil or whatever it does feel kind of like a movie that is written by ai like yeah it's like what is the son's name sunny you know like it, it, it's just like all, hitting all of the tropes it's just like we put all of roland emmerich's past movies into a machine and this is what like if you told me that's how this movie came about it's like the moon creeps up behind them it's like what okay it it kind of is ridiculous it's almost like a joke but it, that's what makes it such a like it's like a perfect midnight movie. You know, when I saw this in the theater, friend and I went, we had a couple drinks and we had a blast watching it, you know, it, and it has this stuff like you're like, this was around the time when it's like, well, we've got to release this movie in China. It's an independent film that has Chinese backers. So randomly insert Chinese character into this and they will say a couple lines in Chinese and they have to have the line of like, oh, the space shuttle is here. We have some money from the Chinese space program. It has nothing to do with anything. They just had to put it in because they were like, we've got those Chinese dollars, so we need to make sure this plays in China. You know, it was the thing that was very prevalent at the time. Oh, yeah. We have to we have to please our Chinese corporate overlords. We have to <laughs> pay respect. They wrote a giant check. Uh, and you know what? I respect them for that. You know, I'm kind of glad Hollywood's getting out of this because it, it's kind of a dirty little secret that we got a lot of Chinese money in our bigger Hollywood mm. productions of the last 10 years. And, you know, there are some contingencies that come with that money. We get some actors sometimes get a great actor. Uh, other times you get an actor that, you know, maybe English <laughs> is a second language. And that does inf unfortunately impact pack the performance but like you know it's hard because like you said there are sensibilities i think that i don't want to get into a whole global cinema conversation i just think the sensibilities of the chinese audience and the american audiences are obviously different and when we try to smash that together into a blockbuster those two flavors don't mix all the time they work sometimes yeah but here it feels like very weird and obvious like here is producer's niece She's in the movie. We're going to yeah. hear a lot of business. She gets a love story. She gets a giant moment. Yeah. I want to say really quick, too, on the So Bad It's Good tip. I loved your take on the, the AIs writing like 10,000 different scripts. To me, I totally felt that, but I felt it in less the disaster way and more in the way that like general character scenes work. So like you and I watch a lot mm -hmm. of movies. We understand how two characters interact in a scene. This is like an AI of a copy of a copy of a soap opera of a copy. Because like you said, you know, just like the kid's name is Sonny, like there's something so canned. You can predict what a character is going to say before they say it. That's what kind of movie yeah. this is. So if two characters are interacting, if a mom meets her kid, the first thing they're going to do is like, be like, I told you the last time that your dad is trying hard to win his life back and you need to be a part of that. Like, it's very soap opera y. The stakes are ridiculous. Like the human stakes are ridiculous. Of course, the moon shit is crazy. But the human stakes feel so canned and false that yeah. uh, it's kind of amazing. Because you, you really can play a game where you guess the dialogue and you will be right. Yeah. And like, you know, a good example of that, I feel like, is the Michael Pena character who feels like, you know, very much like the uh, new new husband to the divorced ex-wife of the main character. And he's just here to, you know, have this conflict with the son. And then he's like, I always thought of you as a son. And you're like, well, this motherfucker is dead. Like in the next scene, you know, like, you're like, I know exactly what's going to happen with that. A lot of unfortunate business, too, because in the middle of I think the best sequence of this movie and unfortunately turns into a Lexus commercial. <laughs> we can't over we can't oh my over god that. yes like not only is michael pena's character a car dealer he works at a lexus dealership while they're in the middle of a crazy car chase that is probably my favorite scene in this, this entire movie it basically devolves into a glorified in movie lexus ad where it becomes a commercial the characters are commenting on the quality of the car switch it into sport mode they're like advertising all the features the new lexus has i was i somehow like breezed past that on my initial viewing when i watched this yesterday for the show i was like what the fuck is happening right now are we <laughs> stopping the action to have a lexus ad i was like what the, f the fucking balls on emmerich why i know why but why it's rhetorical no and i think because that is something i definitely noted when i first saw it and then 
I took a note of it rewatching it this time because there's that moment when, yeah, they are having that car chase and the whole time, I guess they have it in like eco mode or whatever. And then Pena just goes, switch it into overdrive, maximum overdrive. And then it's, it's a, it's a close up of the dial and you see him turn it to sport and then it starts going faster. And I was like, that is the most insane product placement I've ever seen in a movie. And it feels perfectly at home with this insane fucking movie. Once again, it feels like an AI's example of product placement. Yes. And also, too, that, the Lexus ad, the dumb way people interact, and like, okay, so it's a movie about the moon crashing into Earth. Okay, cool idea, ridiculous, but it's Roland Emmerich, okay? So, of course, AI would see that concept and go, well... We need to have some social unrest. So on the side of the fucking shuttle, someone has... Everybody is fleeing. Life as we know it has been turned upside down. People are dying. Breakdown of society. Someone took the time to tag and spray paint the side of the shuttle. Fuck the moon. Because that's what an AI thinks human beings would do. That's what I'm saying. I had to laugh. I yeah. forgot about the. I forgot about so much dumb stuff in this movie. We can run it down, but like the fuck the moon thing on the side of the shuttle was stu- was amazing and stupid, or stupidly amazing rather. The Lexus ad was stupidly amazing. The fact that the guy from Game of Thrones. I'm sorry, I forgot his name. That guy is British. Simple thing. His mom, mm-hmm. no British accent. She's American. There is no explanation for it, but that's the level. That's the level. This is the kind of movie where it's like, well, maybe his mom's American and there's a rich backstory. No, it's just that they no, were right. like, I don't give a shit. She doesn't have a British accent and he's British. Who gives a shit? Moonfall. Yeah. Yeah. And then, like, you know, just to plot that. So, you know, something else that I noticed, like, why would his mom always tell him, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness? Like, why would she, like, he repeats it multiple times. She always tells him, I'm like, if you're fucking around as a kid, your mom would absolutely never say that to you. And there's so many like weird things like that in the movie. Like my favorite one is that they're like, well, we need a way to explain, get this expository dialogue out. Well, how about we roll Donald Sutherland out in a wheelchair? He's going to tell Halle Berry the whole conspiracy. And then he's going to roll away and shoot himself in the face. (laughs) It's insane. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you for bringing up Donald Sutherland. So, This movie misses a lot of opportunities, but the Donald Sutherland is the worst one because, as you know, he's his claim to fame. The thing he's known for in the horror and sci-fi community is Invasion of the Body Snatchers. His famous scene where he goes, "Ah," right? Everybody's seen it. It's been memed. It's on T-shirts. How do you cast that guy and not have him be an alien of some kind? Or an AI projection of some kind. I kept waiting for when the movie really goes full tilt sci-fi for like when the the AI's projecting, I kept waiting for him to come back because I was like, that would be, that feels like classic Emmerich to make that connection for the audience, that bit of stun casting, bring him in. That is absolutely not what happens to the 2022 Emmerich of today. He has no time for that. He's like, nope, we got Donald Sutherland for the day and that's all we could afford. That's that's what we can get with this money. That's it. Mm -hmm. And, And speaking of like weird character stuff, the other one that I noted, and uh, t- tell me what you thought about this, because it, it, re- it was very weird to me both times I watched it, is the whole dynamic of Halle Berry and Patrick Wilson, because it feels the entire time like they're clearly setting these people up to be together at the end. Like, because it starts with like, oh, you guys fight like an old married couple, or and then we're, you know, she's my work wife, blah, 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 and they're both newly married or whatever, and then they, you know, cuts the years later, they both have gone through their own divorces and then they have like a bunch of strife. And over the course of the movie, they come back together. There's a lot of flirtation. Even the last scene between them, they're like, we're make a really good couple. Yeah, we do. And you're like, oh, this is the moment. And then it just just doesn't happen. They're just like, we're a great team. Anyway, the end of the movie is now. Like it felt I was like, did something get cut? What what did like, AI, what's your take on that? Did the AI hiccup because it missed the golden opportunity for that scene at the end. If they actually did get together to kiss and say, I love you to the moon and back. Come on, AI. It was right there. <laughs> yes, I agree hundred percent with you. It is set up and played exactly like that. And I don't think it's some like clever subversion of expectation, like, ooh, the audience will go mm. on a trip with us and think that that's what's gonna happen, and then we're gonna flip it on them. 
this no one that made this movie is that smart <laughs> it's it's just a weird misguided choice like every other choice in this movie can we talk about the fact that okay I, I'm glad you brought up Halle Berry, and I'm glad you brought up Patrick Wilson, right? This was okay. two big stars. Poor Patrick Wilson needs a better agent because he keeps getting bad movies. Yes. And he's, <laughs> and he's a great guy and a great actor, but mm-hmm. God, he has just been like in one meatball after another. <laughs> I have to say, this movie doesn't wake up for about 45 minutes. The first 45 minutes is everything Derek just said. It's like, it's a lot of establishing pieces um, I think it thinks it's a different kind of movie than it actually is. It's like Halle Berry and uh, and Patrick Wilson fighting. Oh, the stuff happens where he's kind of been ashamed. He's been disgraced at his job. We have to fill the audience in that his shit at home sucks. Um, she's now the head of NASA. We're doing all this table setting. And you're like, whoa, is this a Roland Emmerich movie? What's going on? Things haven't blown up yet. And then it's almost like the movie goes in a big rush to kind of give you the broad strokes of what it thinks a Roland Emmerich movie is. Okay, we got to see a tidal wave. You know, it can't just be one or two mm. boats. Apparently, everybody's yacht was docked that day because there's like 89 yachts that roll through town. Okay, all right, fun. Those are rolling in. Waves are crashing. There's a flood, right? I actually, and as as much as I waited for that big disaster piece stuff, because I was not interested in anything that was happening with the actors, you know, because there were so many dumb choices like, Again, AI, like Patrick Wilson's character is broke and can't afford rent because he's supposed to be an underdog, I guess. That makes you root for him. Yet he still has his like super fancy antique motorcycle, super fancy sport car, things he could sell or collateral to pay his rent, pay his bills. Anyway, that's the kind of movie this is. I wasn't interested in any of that work. I was interested in getting to the disaster stuff. The disaster stuff was so forced and rushed. I actually didn't like the movie until it went full tilt weird like where it was Mm -hmm. like okay well what would happen if the moon truly did begin to fall out of orbit it would begin to fuck with the gravity it would begin to fuck with the weather our sense of time is going to be different we're gonna have all this crazy time displacement these weird events i love the like little touches of like oh no the moon's coming again coming around faster everybody's fleeing the nasa site and the two nasa guys have to run to the chopper to get out and they're bounding like superman yeah. they're like, bounding like even though they're on there's no gravity there's fucking bounding it looks great and it's such a silly detail but like i think that full tilt sci-fi stuff is when the movie sort of gets it right same deal with the car chase which is like my favorite bit in the movie same deal when she's got to tr- you know lift the tree off the guy like of course like let's have fun with that stuff get into the weirdness of the idea that the moon is a mega structure that that was like something again i don't listen to alex jones so that was something that like was completely foreign to me. I've never heard that before. I'd never heard of megastructuralism or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It just felt like a great sci-fi, zany sci-fi problem in a movie. But yeah, man, I think the first 45 minutes are rough, rough, rough stuff. Mm -hmm. But at least once you go full tilt sci-fi, it kind of starts to make up for it a little bit. Yeah, I I totally agree because this movie is just, just so weird that it's like, how can you not enjoy it? And also, like, they clearly spent a lot of money on this movie, and it's all up there on the screen. They are trying things. They it's there's some there's something to be said about, you know, a low budget, so bad it's good movie, like a Neil Breen thing or something like that. It's got a charm to it. But I always do enjoy a big colossal failure like this a little more where there it's like they are swinging for the fences you know to to use a phrase that i like to say they are do, taking a big swing and sometimes when you take a big swing it is a home run but sometimes when you take a big swing you strike out in a absolutely spectacular way and that's what i think they did here and yeah just like re-watching it this time i really took a note of like how fucking good all of the effects were, all the weird ideas. You know, you mentioned that, you know, all the, like, the bounding stuff like that. I mean, it would be, the scenarios would be ridiculous. It's like you put the car in eco mode and now you can go over the cracking cliff and the bad guys that are chasing you smash into the thing. That's dumb as hell, but fuck, I had fun watching it and it looked dope. Yes. Also, again, AI, what the fuck? No moon roof joke? It was right there. Again, <laughs> it's this easy stuff that, like, you need a human screenwriter to get. You do AI to get your scripts, people. This is the crap you get. You miss these easy opportunities. I kept waiting for them to punch the top of the Lexus out and for somebody to go, moon roof. Never. 
Dude, and also, I have to say, because I'm going to keep harping on this. Yes, the Lexus part sucks. That that car chase is amazing uh, for, for many reasons. C- can I tell you why I love the car chase? I'm like, Please. I'm obsessed the car chase. Here's why that car chase is awesome. Because in the middle of this, if you think about it in a real world, you know, I, I if you gra- try to ground your view for a moment, <laughs> if this truly was happening and society was breaking down, it's a great fucking concept to have people just out pretending like now real life, the, the rules are gone. They're just treating real life like it's Grand Theft Auto. And they're going to take it up a notch. They're not just going to steal cars or rob things. They're going after oxygen. What a great that's a great stupid thing. Like in yeah. that writer's room, applaud that person. That's a great stupid notch in the belt right there because that's exactly what would happen. And you have this great bit where, you know, the family led by uh, Louis, uh, Michael Pena is, you know, they have the oxygen that they've borrowed from the fire department. They're trying to get away. And then you have the robbers, right, who are following them to boost the oxygen. We get a fucking gunfight in the car. I loved the insanity of it, but then at, to raise the bar, all right, on a visual level, on a sheer scale, we get the bit where the moon is crossing. So now it's messing with gravity. Now things are blowing up, exploding. So you've got tankers flying into the scene as a car chase is happening. Kind of like it's not just watching the destruction, kind of like, okay, Roland Emmerich puts the pieces and now we watch the Chrysler building explode. It's like, no. We're in a car chase experiencing this Roland Emmerich thing while this moon thing is happening and there's a gunfight and it's a Lexus commercial because we need the money. And it's just so bananas to me. And that's when the movie woke up where I was like, what a movie. This is great. All I'm missing is like a (laughs) like a giant beer, a bunch of pretzels. Fuck it. You know, let's get in here. Everybody smoke, smoke out the room. Let's have an amazing time with this sequence because I was just floored by the audacity of that sequence yeah yeah definitely and i think there's it's nothing's more frustrating when you see a movie that has a really cool concept that's really interesting that is just not ever realized you know and one people love to bring up is like the the purge you know the 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 first purge, not the first purge but like the original purge movie to come out and how that movie got dinged for like oh yeah like there's this whole idea of a purge but it's just kind of a typical home invasion movie. And obviously people heard that criticism and all the rest of the purges really leaned into that concept. But they didn't need a, a first purge movie to get wrong. They were like, this movie is called Moonfall. The fucking moon is going to fall. Like, exactly what it says on the tin, you are fucking getting. Have you played Majora's Mask? Because that shit is happening now again in this movie. First off, what a poll. I love that you have I love that you had a Majora's mask toss in there. That is great. I needed um, to work it in somehow. <laughs> thank you. And you know what? All the Zelda fans are happy about that. So we appreciate you, Derek. Uh you're doing the good work. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You're right. If it says it on the poster, the mm-hmm. moon had better fall, and boy oh boy does it. And it it all the ideas surrounding that, even just besides the megastructure, just the destruction on Earth and the way that's dealt with, I think is aces. It is so stupid, it's aces. And then you get to the real, I mean, it wants to be Kubrick 2001 so bad, mm-hmm. even down to like, now here is a projection of a person you know talking to you from your past. Like, <laughs> yeah, it was it was just funny because recently I just I won't go off on a tangent here about the abyss, but I just rewatched the abyss for my show. And it's funny because the abyss basically does this exact ending. We've got a guy flying into the middle of an alien craft. He sort of stops in this like plane background. The alien shows up and it's like, here, I'm going to show you a screen, everything that's happening. And we're going to project some things to you so that we can quickly go over our history and what's happening. And that is exactly what happened here. And I had to laugh to myself because I was like, wow, we really have locked on to the this trope. This is definitely a trope. Mm. It's not a trope you think of right away, but rubber stamp this trope because it's here. If your guy goes into a spaceship in your movie, the alien has got to give him a glorified PowerPoint presentation. How he delivers that information is up to him, up to you, the filmmaker. Here it was it was begging for the return of Donald Sutherland. That would have been so sweet as a yeah. counter fan, like smart, smart, smart. But instead, we get the crappy, we get both crappy sons, versions of of Patrick Wilson's son. The little one is bad. I try not to rag on kid actors, but that kid was terrible. Um, (laughs) The older kid is fine, but that kid actor is rough stuff at first. Uh, Yeah. But it's cool. Like, the 
that is one thing that I think the AI mm-hmm. did successfully on its script was the way the backstory of of the moon as a megastructure, I thought was actually very cool. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. The that when they have that whole they just kind of stop the movie to be like, here's the backstory. And it, like there was this whole history in the planet, and you're you know, the moon was what seeded the earth with like fucking Prometheus DNA or whatever. And you know what it reminded me a lot, you talking about how this is a trope. It really, like, beat for beat felt a lot like, did you ever watch Mission to Mars? Yes. That Disney movie. Okay. Yes, Brian De Palma. Yes. Which is a movie that, like, I don't, I liked it a lot as a kid. I haven't revisited it as an adult, so it just kind of lives in my memory as being good when it, I don't know how, like, accurate that is, but the end where it's like Gary Sinise goes up to Mars and it's like he finds out there's this whole mystery there and what's going on and it's like, oh, he goes to the face and there's this big structure inside and then these these aliens tell them like actually the earth was came from here this this thing that's really you know another thing in the solar system that's pretty close to earth and they seeded it and that's where humanity and life on earth came from is actually from this other thing and i was like this is like like very similar to this movie that like everyone kind of hates and forgot about so like i was really drawing those comparisons yes absolutely also shout out to my fellow disney heads uh disney world mission space is mission to mars the ride Mm mm-hmm but yeah, I, I think there are certain, uh, definitely Emmerich loves this idea, this thread that aliens basically are responsible for humanity, that they they planted the seed for humanity right. and basically created like, you can go back all the way to Stargate, the thing that inducted me into my role in Emmerich movies. Again, treats it like, oh yeah, aliens uh, populated the universe and that's kind of how that explains the pyramids and crop circles and why you know these humans look like this and these humans are over here on this other planet that's basically a carbon copy of earth i do i do see that emrick loves that uh so it was kind of funny to see him uh, in a way re- return to his roots um i'm not sure if he injected that in there or if the ai did i refuse to believe this movie was written by actual people uh if the ai injected it in there because it's funny. It's it's a running thing through his movies, and not even in like a conspiratorial way. Not even in his in his like anonymous, uh, the patriot kind of way. Like, no, he clearly likes this idea. And again, that's why it would have been so perfect to have Donald Sutherland in delivering that information. Would have been perfect. Yeah, and I do. I honestly wonder. Like, is he somebody who actually believes in conspiracy theories, or is he someone like me who like? I, I hate cons- like on like I hate people who believe in conspiracy theories. I think they're all insane and garbage and stuff like that. But I'm also super fascinated by them and yeah. think that they make for very interesting, compelling films. So I'm just like, how much of the stuff does anyone does he believe? Because I'm like, I've, I've heard him say some stuff about like you know we brought up Anonymous. Like he thinks that this Shakespeare conspiracy. Because like, I think Anonymous is actually fun and interesting. But I'm like, this is not history. This is like a fun. <laughs> historical fiction but i like he maybe believes that so i'm like how much does he believe about the movie (laughs) okay all right i think though you're saying it's interesting and i agree with you it's interesting Mm. in that coffee shop conversation kind of way we're like all right neither of us believe this because we're normal and sane people but isn't this fun to imagine what if shakespeare wasn't really shakespeare and another guy had written all his plays okay i think roland emmerich is twofold I think he does, a part of him does believe it, but I think he also likes that archetype because it has also followed him in his career. Have you seen 2012? I have, yeah. Okay, Woody Harrelson is basically, he's kind of a combination of the Game of Thrones guy in this movie and almost a little bit uh, Donald Sutherland in this movie as well, where he's basically just like a conspiracy nut who's been tracking the Mayans. And that one was all about, I forgot what it was. It was like the ice exploding and all the little stuff coming down the debris. But it's the same guy. It's a guy with a, it's a conspiracy nut with a blog. Like, I think Emmerich has a soft spot for that crankpot character and likes to put yeah. him in and then uses that character as a vessel for like, I can't say this. I am I think he's like a German. I, I can't say this at my dinner party, but I will use Woody Harrelson to say it for me. And then no one will accuse me then, right? So I think that's what's going on. Okay, that may, and it's because, yeah, you bring up an interesting point because it's never the main character. It's always like a side guy who brings it to the main character. It's always like Woody Harrelson presented it to John Cusack or Sam from Game of Thrones bringing it to Patrick Wilson. Um, so, yeah, I think that is kind of... A, a fascinating wrinkle 
Uh, and I just wanted to circle back to something we brought up, you brought up way a while back, but I thought it was really a good point because I also had it in my notes and that's about Patrick Wilson and how, yeah, I don't know if it's his agent or if he's just really bad at selecting things. And that's not to say he's not in good stuff because he is in good movies, but all of the most popular, famous Patrick Wilson roles are in the worst thing. And I'm like, is he in on it? It's hard to tell. Like, it's really difficult because, yeah, it's like this or it's like a bunch of like horror just schlock that he's apparently like now he's like it's two different horror series, he, one of which he's gone on to direct now. And I know some people like those movies, but definitely not my cup of tea or like, you know, he's eating fucking cockroaches in the Aquaman sequel. God, yeah. Jeez, yeah. it's, it's, what is what is going on with Patrick Wilson, man? I know he deserves better because he's actually a great leading man, I think. And I've seen him in some good stuff. I think, you know, good is a relative term. But like, I think Watchmen, he does amazing work. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I it's I think he is one of these actors who is in, in love with the idea of what if he doesn't think beyond the surface. So he gets a packet on his desk from his agent that says Roland Emmerich disaster movie. You're the star. And he's like, oh, that sounds amazing. And he accepts without reading, thinking about it, <laughs> walking it through. I think he's in love with the sticker on the car. And that's what he buys. And then he's too committed. He's signed the deal. He can't walk away now. And that's how you get shit. Because, like, I think sometimes that works for him, right? He sees the sticker. He's like, oh, Aquaman, James Wan, the DC movie. This is going to be huge. And then whoops. Right. It just like keeps happening to him. He lucked out into that Conjuring franchise. Those movies, I think, also have also kind of like it's been diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. I like the Insidious movies more than most. But yeah, even that it's like it's he needs you know what he needs? He needs like a and I'm not saying he can fulfill the same type of roles, but he needs like a Sam Rockwell. Path. Mm. OK, get him with Martin McDonough, get him with somebody who can get some weird performances where it's OK to be weird, where he can kind of get away from his looks. Just let him be an actor, because then I think he would actually get onto something. But, yeah, I think this guy is just tricked. He's tricked. It's an easy deception to fall for. If I was at a cocktail party and Roland Emmer came up to me and he was like, I'm going to make another movie. You're going to be I'd be like, this is going to be amazing. This can change my life. And then I get there and it's, it's fucking Moonfall. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is too he's like always really good in bad movies like yeah. it's it's one of the things is like i don't know if he understands the assignment or he just has the right vibes but like to once again you know obviously in this i think he's phenomenal he's kind of like wisecracking and stuff like that but like even in aquaman 2 which is like a pretty for the most part irredeemable movie he is just having so much fun. Like whenever it's one of the, it's that meme. It's like wh whenever Patrick Wilson is on screen, people should be asking, where is Patrick Wilson? Like he just brings <laughs> right. so much to that film. And like Jason Momoa, like I like Jason Momoa, but he's really just trying to be Chris Hemsworth in that movie. And he's, he's funny in like a, like a casual, like my man way. But when he's just trying to do straight up comedy, I don't think it works Um, in the way that like Patrick Wilson is just like, kind of playing the straight man like the very serious like yes i'm or man it's like real. it's way funnier than anything anyone else is in that movie when they're trying to be funny and i'd say similar vibes in this one too and then to just kind of continue on that one thing that i noticed was you know his interaction with and i'm going to keep calling him sam from game of thrones that did that interaction feel weird to you because it felt like like they should have really like maybe it speaks to what you were talking about earlier, where like the first 45 seemed to lag, where they're like opposed, like for a while, where he's like this crazy conspiracy guy. And like, why you saw this thing? You're like, th like this cloud, you're discredited for basically this conspiracy that everyone's trying to cover up. You see someone who's like, there's a conspiracy. There's this thing going on with the moon. Just like screenwriting trick, just make him be like, huh, there's somebody else, like this guy's kind of a crackpot, but maybe he can explain why this whole thing happened to me. That seems like a shortcut they should have taken. You know, am I, uh, what do you think? Absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. It's weird. Again, it's like they think that, oh, okay, because he has this kind of tete-a-tete -tete interplay with Halle Berry, he should mm -hmm. also have that 
with Sam from Game of Thrones, because that's how the audience reads mismatched buddy duo, right? That again, like an AI computer was like, this is what buddy comedy is. They are mismatched. Ha ha ha. He has IBS. He is handsome. <laughs> like that's that's what it takes. Like, dude, there is I felt so bad for Sam from Game of Thrones when mm. his character is basically just like demeaned to having to say like i have anxiety i have ibs because like i was like why is this this character's life doesn't suck enough we have to also give him all of these conditions like he lives alone mother in a nursing home the cat's the only friend been uh, denied entry into his field of study everybody thinks he's a fucking crank nope that's not enough we also now have to give him the fu- it can't just be any condition he's got to have ibs because that's funny they treat it like a joke in the movie it's it's just kind of sad because, again, that's what the AI thinks reads as a joke. And then they have to be contentious because that's what it thinks it reads as a, oh, budding, unlikely friends come together because it's so weird. OK, to highlight what you're talking about, mm-hmm. they have their tete-a-tete, but then they're together kind of like once the tidal wave hits and they're even sharing a hotel room, which why are they wasting time sleeping? That made no sense. <laughs> also, how did the government find them? That also made no sense. But then when the when NASA picks them up, the first thing he starts doing before Halle Berry walks in the room, keep in mind now we've seen them become friendly, mm-hmm. is the is just tear him down. It's so weird because then later on we're supposed to believe they're best buddies. Like when he decides to sacrifice himself, Patrick Wilson is like in tears. Like it's supposed to be like fucking Kirk and Spock at the end of Wrath of Khan. And I didn't feel that at all. I was like, I don't buy this for one second. Did yeah. you? No, I did not. It, it's it's a definitely like a plot contrivance that the you know the AI writer had to put in to get them to this point. And there, there's a lot of there are quite a lot of those. One that really you know was not as fun for me and kind of took me out of the movie a little bit is when they're like, ah, well this engine has failed. Well, I guess we must immediately send everyone home. Don't take five minutes to think about this. Everyone's gone. Oh, well, we've just thought of a solution that we could have thought of when everyone's here, but we needed a way to get just three three characters onto the space shuttle with no other team or anything like that. And that was just like the laziest way to do it. A hundred percent. Also, and then it doubles down on the laziness because it's like, oh, the the sort of AI that's up there pro- pro- uh, protecting the moon megastructure senses tech, senses technology. Mm. So we have to go in the old school space suits that don't have any tech or wiring or computer systems in them. Our shuttle's going to fly totally blind, no tech, so that we can go in under the radar. Okay, first off, fuck that shit. Peter Berg did that exact same thing in the Battleship movie. It's literally the exact same thing. (laughs) It's like, here come the aliens. What is Rihanna and the Navy going to do? We got to go back to the old way we used to do shit before computers. So we're using charts and pings and stuff. Right. Stole it. And again, this movie doesn't want to think beyond that. The movie succeeds when it does think beyond that. Again, the ridiculousness of a car chase during a moonfall, the ridiculousness of the of the moon being this mega structure. That's cool stuff we've never seen before. But like that kind of shit to be like, now they're going to go the old school astronaut suits. It felt so tired. I know nobody saw Battleship. That's what they were counting on. They were counting on two things. They were counting on nobody having seen Battleship. And nobody having seen Lost World Jurassic Park because they stole the fucking joke. They stole a joke. They get to the ship, the megastructure, and they're, they lose Patrick Wilson. And they're like, Patrick, or his name is Brian or Brian Harper. Brian, Brian Harper, where are you? And she turns, yes. how many Brian Harpers do you think are on here? And I was like, hey, that's from Lost World. You stole it. Yeah. How many Sarah Hardings do you think are on this island? I totally <laughs> forgot that was, yes. You're a fellow Jurassic Park fan. I, I fucking knew you would appreciate that because I was like, the uh, again, the balls on this AI to decide it was going to steal that joke like we wouldn't notice. We noticed. We noticed. We noticed the theft from that. We noticed the theft from Mission to Mars. All these movies that I think nobody has seen. Well, guess what? Me and Matt are cinephiles of some schlock and we fucking saw it. That's right. That's right, AI. You can't beat humanity. You can't. John Connor warned us about you. You can't fuck <laughs> us. We we know, man. We're already ahead yep. of you. You think you can destroy us with the moon? Well, it's not going to be that easy because we have Halle Berry and <laughs> Patrick Wilson. That's right. That's right. God damn yeah. it. We're here. We're we're catching the AI. Yeah. I also have to say, OK, hmm. now I'm going to go back. This is like a love hate because now I'm going to go back to loving the movie for a moment. 
Can we talk about how cool it is? I think it's a be- like legitimately. No, I'm not being funny. I think it's a mm-hmm. legitimately beautiful sequence when their rover falls through the cavern that's inside the middle of the moon. And it's just like that giant black hole that they're traveling down. And he, he gets them to fly close to the side of the tunnel. To me, I remember that from the big screen. It was not as cool on my television. I have a nice TV, <laughs> but it was not as cool. Mm-hmm. On the big screen, that sequence was phenomenal. And again, that's just like fun, visual fireworks from Roland Emmerich. No thanks to the AI on that one. Yeah, no, because like we said, this movie looks great. It's like a movie that I had a really good time seeing up on the big screen. And it is a little bit sad that not too many people did. It, it This does, movie does feel like a movie that is stuck in the early aughts in a lot of ways. And that, you know, it is part of this dying genre. But I think that maybe if throughout all this kind of these contrivances and the cliches and, you know, the things that we've been jokingly saying uh, are like written by AI, if it made it try to catch up a little bit, I think that you legitimately could have a movie that is in this genre that could be a hit. You just got to stay with the times a little bit, you know? A hundred percent. And I, I think that it's not just in concept, right? I think it's an execution too, to kind of update and get with the times, because I think the concept of the moon and it being a megastructure is something novel, something that I think Mm -hmm. modern audiences have not seen, but I think with the proper execution, it could have been it could have been an A24 level, like ooh, a real a real brain buster, right? Uh, I think about what what somebody like Alex Garland would do with that with that budget. Great. You know, he would really I mean, I'm sure he would do something extra weird. <laughs> it would not be palatable <laughs> for, for a, a mass audience. But I do think Roland Emmerich, again, it's I like to hear satisfaction, you know, to to, to borrow mm-hmm. that from from Chef, right? If 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 the Stones didn't play satisfaction, would you be upset? And he's like, yeah. If if Roland Emmerich has to play his hits all the time, that's cool. But I would love if he learned some new songs. That would be amazing. Exactly. You you when you see the killers, you want to hear Mr. Brightside, but you also want to hear the the new stuff. You know, you want to hear what what oh you want to be the first one to hear the new song, the new album that's gonna drop. You gotta get a little bit of both. Absolutely. Don't be the guy at the show that boos when the new songs play. Fuck that person. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, there's a, we've talked about a lot of the good and the bad and how those are kind of some of the same things sometimes. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on on the good or the bad of this movie or just, you know, in general about this whole thing? Yeah, I <laughs> I have I have one more thing that I want to touch yes, on. Yes, please. And that is this idea that we need I I hate the idea of like needing to force some kind of like familial memory to make Mm -hmm. you it's such an easy shorthand it's like and the thing i'm talking about is again michael pena gets the worst bits in this movie the bit with his daughter makes no sense so her her oxygen tank is faulty and she's like i can't breathe and he's like oh okay no problem and they trade oxygen tanks and we know he's gonna die at this point but it's such a weird thing that he leaves her with it's not it's not some memory like okay run run like we used to run in little league it's it's something weird where he goes just walk left right left left right left i was like a if she walked left right left she would be walking funny she would not be walking the way that a normal human being walks (laughs) but also he's not a military guy so that made no sense the little girl reacts like it's oh i guess i don't know how to fucking walk like it's in that moment that I'm like, it calls to, to something that I'm like, I think this is such a shitty shorthand for trying to manipulate, to emotionally manipulate your audience. It's enough that the little girl's oxygen tank doesn't work. We're human beings. We're fucking scared for her because she's a little girl and we have hearts. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We don't need the extra step of you applying some fake bull crap on top that doesn't even make sense. None of that's hard. It made it weird. It made me not care about the little girl. I was like, just let it be. Anyway, I wanted to touch on that because I thought it was so bizarre. Uh, I hated also that Sam from Game of Thrones' cat was named Fuzz Aldrin. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I hated yeah. that. I, I also hated the quick shorthand when Patrick Wilson was in the dumpster digging, trying to find the uh, coordinates that Sam got rid of. And he's been digging, presumably he's like all full of trash, you know, and he's like been digging in the dumpster for hours. And of course, the minute the night security guard shows up, he's like, are you looking for these? And he points at the papers that are right in front of the dump. It's not like he had to dig. 
So Patrick Wilson's character would have had to have stepped over those, gone into the dumpster to just bathe in trash and not see them. It was that kind of stuff where I was like, I can't believe this is the same guy who gave us, I'm back, you fuckers, right? Like, mm-hmm. and gave us President Whitmore, you know, that that Independence Day speech. It, uh, Halle Berry wanted to have that speech so bad when she was telling people to go home. And I was like, it's not working. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that That's yeah. all I got. That's all I got. I, I hope in the future that Roland Emmerich, because I, I, I do, I'm a sucker for a disaster movie, but I think... I don't think he needs to reinvent the wheel and don't play your hits. In fact, if I was Roland Emmerich's agent or like the little angel on his shoulder, I would say, remake something that you don't have anything to do with. We need a towering Inferno remake. You could be the guy. Just saying. Do that. Bring us something cool. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I don't know that Roland Emmerich is ever going to make a movie like this again. You know, like the studios obviously kind of stopped giving him money before this. This one, he had to get independently f- funded after the results of this movie. Doesn't look like that will happen again. Um, so he might be in director jail a little bit, but I don't think that means he's never going to make anything again because he does clearly have other things that disaster movie he makes. We talked about Anonymous a lot. Um, he also has, of course, you know, Roland Emmerich is a gay man and he made Stonewall. You know, that's a movie that is obviously nothing like this. Uh, and I would love to see some more of his one for me, so, you know, some things that he is passionate about, some stuff like that. And I think that, you know, that might be the next Roland Emmerich we would get is something that is a lot more personal with a much more scaled down budget, a much more um, personal and um, just, you know, films that's driven by more acting than effects with a presumably much strong, stronger script and something that, unlike this one, doesn't end with a shameless sequel pitch that will obviously never happen that will never in a million years happen. what was the point don't even do it don't waste anyone's time you've put sam from game of thrones through enough you're gonna make him do this bullshit scene it doesn't go anywhere right let this man go home he doesn't want to do this anymore <laughs> <laughs> well matt thank you thank you so much before before i let you go before i let you do your final pitch or anything I wanted to ask you, because, you know, we talked about your schlock credentials. What's what's one of your favorite schlocky movies? And it might be a so bad it's good or it might just be something that's underrated. Give us give us a, some schlock. Oh. And it doesn't have to be like the best over anything. But, and you know, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but I always try to do this to my guests. Give them something good to pitch here at the end. Not at all. I'm going to cheat and look at my letterbox. I will tell you, if you want some good space schlock, space theme schlock, you can't go wrong with the incredible Melting Man. I actually think it's it, on one of the streamers, Tubi or Amazon Prime Video right now. You can watch free with ads. Really fun 70s. Uh, space uh, monster movie. I won't go into more detail. If it sounds like it's up your alley, you will like it. Uh, you will know right away if you want to watch that movie from the poster because it is grotesque. Uh, um, I will also, I do want to call out, wait, I have my, my letterboxed here. <laughs> I do also do want to call out, we're going to go for schlock, The Vagrant. This is a movie that doesn't take place in space. It takes place in the real world, starring a very young Bill Paxton. Rest in peace, Bill Paxton. Simple premise. I'm going to set this up for you. Bill Paxton wants to buy a starter home. He shows up. He starts remodeling the home, gussying it up. A vagrant lives there and doesn't want to leave. This turns into one of the most bizarre horror comedies of the 90s you've never seen. It feels like a Lost Tales from the Crypt episode. Awesome, awesome movie. That one is on Tubi as well. Uh, but I would call it schlock because it is definitely a whole lot of schlock. Yeah, I, I really think you can't go wrong with either one of those movies. And also, let, let's go for a little highbrow schlock. Schlock, but mm-hmm. highbrow. We want to talk about sci-fi. Go for Silent Running. You want to go to space? Go to space with Bruce Stern and Silent Running. I think uh, you will you will get some good old-fashioned space schlock out of that one, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm always a fan of schlock, especially highbrow schlock and you know i'll throw out one and it's it's not like a deep cut or anything but one of my favorite 80s schlock movies is the running man i i fucking oh, love great, the running man great movie <laughs> now plane zero one of the best jokes ever right oh god it's so good and like arnold is just pitch perfect in that one He's great. Any Arnold, any 80s Arnold is amazing. To this day, my co-host and I, Mark, I've known the guy over 20 years. We still quote Commando to each other where he goes, remember when I promised to kill you last? I lied. (laughs) And he drops the guy. 
fucking thing of beauty. One of the best moments ever in cinema, man. So awesome. Yep. Always, Arnold always has understood the assignment. <laughs> and just like Matt, you have always understood the assignment. So thank you once again for coming on and shooting the shit with me about this fucking great movie that is terrible, but it's also great. Um, where can people hear the Matt and Mark movie show? What do you want to let people know before you go? Hey, uh, thank you for that, Derek. Always a pleasure to be here talking shop, talking film with you anytime. I'm down, buddy. Um, the Matt and Mark movie show. Do catch us. We're available on all the big podcast platforms on social. It's at the Matt and Mark movie show. Uh, you can catch us on TikTok, Instagram. We've got some fun retro reviews up right now. Uh, St. Patty's Day just passed. And guess what? We did the obvious thing and we reviewed the very first Leprechaun with an Englishman. We should have gotten an Irishman, but uh, we do talk <laughs> about that. Uh, we do. We discuss whether or not Irish people actually like that movie. <laughs> or whether they're offended by it. It was pretty cool. Uh, we've also done uh, stuff like Dr. Giggles has been great. And it's it's great. We returned to the cinema recently, too, to review the new Blumhouse, Imaginary. So we've got some fun episodes. And this week, we're returning to the cinema for Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Can't wait. Very excited to see if it can live up to the hype I think we all have in our minds. I doubt it. But uh, yeah, <laughs> come join us. It's just kind of some buddies talking about some schlocky movies, uh, giving them crap. And occasionally we have like some guests who who know their stuff, like Derek here, who's on our show. <laughs> Brings our show up a level when he appears. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I, I definitely, I always have a blast whenever I come on and, uh, and whenever I listen to it as well. Very excited to hear you guys' take on Ghostbusters. Yeah, which would definitely be out by the time this episode drops where everybody go and listen to that once you're once you're done listening to that if you want to if you know you're here for the first time because you're a fan of matt's uh check out the rest of the episodes are underrated if you want to subscribe uh rate us five stars that would be awesome if you want to follow us on social media it's underrated movie podcast on all the social media apps on all the podcast platforms youtube spotify apple wherever podcasts are i guess google podcasts is going away now also of course I have a patreon patreon.com slash underrated movie podcast do two bonus podcasts there one is released sporadically on the marvel cinematic universe that's available for all patrons uh it's called infinity stones and dragon bones a podcast matt has also been on and then of course also the underdogs podcast where i talk about underrated sports films another podcast matt i'm matt i'm you know speaking of infinity stones matt is i'm like collecting math like in, in a stone for each of my podcasts i've got to have, <laughs> have an appearance on everything so oh, man, man i love it i love it infinity stones dragon bones the best podcast name i stand by that i stand by that. that's that's your platform if you ever run for office that you came up with that name <laughs> thank you thank you. i will take that to the bank but yeah if you want to you know listen that's a little as little as a dollar a month but you know if you can't donate or if you just, you know, just don't feel like it you know just drop that five star review that really helps us a lot it's a free way to do it um, and yeah, just keep listening. Hope, uh, hopefully I, you guys hear me next time. Once again, thank you, Matt, for being on. And I'll catch everyone on the next episode of Underrated. Underrated.